Well, hello, welcome, Mr. Stuart Davis. Thank you so much um, for joining me. Thank you for accepting the invitation and being uh, being here now with me. How are you? I'm wonderful, and thank you so much for inviting me. Very excited to have a discussion with you today, and appreciate uh, the thought of it arising. And yeah, just nice to say hello to you face to face in yeah. the digital space. Yes, very much so. Uh, oh, I see you've got your dog back there. Oh, right. This is Tilla. Tilla. He's <laughs> Tilla. Come here. Uh, this is actually the sentient being that I spend the most time with on the entire planet. Cool. Yeah. He's That's about as far as he ever gets away from me. Uh, it's yeah. two or three feet. <laughs> it's usually on my body. Seems like he's very, uh, he loves, um, what do you call it? Um, getting, um, what do you call this? Um, doing, doing some, something nice to him. Uh, oh, can't find contact, just touch. He loves to be yeah. scratched. Yeah. He's yeah. A, that kind of dog that loves contact, right? Very somatic. Very into touch. Yes. He's amazing. Okay. Thanks. Again. That's all. Okay. Sorry. No more interruptions well, from him. No, <laughs> it's, it's great. I, I love dogs also. Right now I have a cat, uh, which is a new experience for me because I, I had never had one. And, and the change, the switch of how you interact with, with different types of, of, uh, of entities, of beings, of people, uh, it's, it's very interesting from the change from, uh, I had a, a black Labrador and mm. now uh, just this kind of wild cat that's in most of the day she's outside and, and she's been learning to, to behave uh, around people. So yeah, and I'm trying to understand how, how others uh, understand the world and what their, their nuances are, especially with animals. It's, it's been really, really a trip for me. I love that. And I share to a very deep recess your appreciation and curiosity around non-human intelligences. And when I use that phrase, I very much mean and include my dog and my cat and my other dog and birds, crows. It's not just non-human intelligences in the form of aliens and, and some of the other stuff I'm sure we'll get into today. It's all absolutely fantastic. And I also would personally add that to have a moment of real attunement with your cat or with your dog, that's as profound, truly if perceived and experienced with beginner's mind, that's as profound as contact with exo world intelligences. There's, it's insuperable. So right off the top, you and I can high five on that. Yeah, totally. It's like kind of religious in a way when you like understand uh, what the animal wants, especially for me in, the, in particular with the things, this thing with uh, learning to connect with a cat, which I, I don't know if people are aware or if it's just something that's personal for me, but the difference between the, the interaction with a dog uh, to the interaction with a cat, it's been so remarkable for me. I, I didn't think it would be, I, I actually treated her like a, like a dog uh, and got scratched <laughs> and beat many many times until i understood okay these are her rules she needs space she she's like uh instead of like the dog needing uh, and loving contact all the time she's like only when i want it and yeah. as soon as i don't want it she she like hops on my lap and then she will get off whenever it's her decision and yeah. it's very interesting for limits learning limits completely i have the same experience with our cat <laughs> that is so amazing and before we started recording, we were, um, I mentioned um, Ken Wilber and the integral community to you. Yeah. Because, and I, I think it's an important uh, piece of the puzzle that, that we're going to be exploring today with you. Because um, there's, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a very interesting non-human experience that, that you that you've had. Um, and I think the, the integral way of looking at this is super important because there's many pitfalls uh, along the way when trying to to grapple with this idea of communication and even contact with with perhaps 
alien entities, uh, just like you said, non-human entities. And like we, many, many people might, might go like very nuts and bolts. Uh, uh, but I think it's, there is something to the, to the, I don't know how to really call it, to the mythological aspect of it, to the symbolic um, archetypal aspect, um, hyperspace um, kind of, the, the, there's so much over there to unpack. And, but my point was that uh, your, your connection to the integral community and especially the fact that you, you, you have a, an integral perhaps lens um, to, to look at this experience and to communicate it, especially you being an artist. And I think that's really cool because it gives a new, um, a new way of, of looking at these, uh, these phenomena that have been happening, as many people might know, for perhaps millennia even, right? Yeah, yeah, completely. Well, shall I tell the Cliff Notes version of my Ken Wilber slash integral stories? Sure, uh, yeah. Of course, they intersect and have a common origin point, but they're distinct. So with Ken, it's a really funny, adorable, personal story. It really was a nuclear detonation in my life. It was a sea change event for me. And that is when... Oh, you reached out for, for a moment. Could you oh. repeat the, the first part? Very sorry for that. No, that's okay. And tell me whenever that happens. Just, sure. I don't mind circling yeah. back. I read Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, and it repatterned and fundamentally reorganized not only my worldview and the available method methodologies, but also how I understood myself as an artist explicitly, because I believe the big change and the real brilliance of sex ecology, spirituality, or Ken's integral work in general, is not that he's so much bringing an entirely new set of features to reality to you it's that he's reflecting back or at least this was my experience reading sex ecology spirituality was reflecting back to me that which i had intuited but had not been able to articulate or consciously organize in an efficient manner so it much more before that book felt as though i was in a dust storm and then after that book it all organized into a very well personified uh, presence that I could communicate with and make progress with. And it launched me off, I would say in a very fundamental way, it was the second beginning. It was, as Christians speak about being re reborn or born again, and I don't want to cast too much of a religious cloak on it, I'm being facetious, but it was a second birth for me as an artist and as a spiritual practitioner. And at that point in my life, Zen Buddhism, integral and art, intersected and finally cohered. And that's where I was able to begin in a second career in which I knew what I was going to write about, where I was going to write from, why creativity was inextricably woven to my spiritual path, stuff like that began to ascend and cohere. So that led me to an interaction with Ken because I just wrote him to say I appreciated the book. And he said, come over to my house. I was on tour all the time. I lived on the road. I went to his house and the first night we talked for six hours and it was one of those conversations you remember all of your life and not so much because of the content, but because of the connection and the attunement and the, the depth of resonance and friendship. And that was also the night that I met his, at that time, girlfriend. And the one minute version of this is that I became best friends with the two of them and spent most time when I was not on tour, I would spend at their house in Boulder. And the three of us became like a family. And then they got married. I was, I performed at their wedding and wrote them a song and I uh, was played a major role in all of that. Then they got divorced. And then all three of us remained friends. And then she, her name is Marcy, Marcy Davis. She and I, fell in love and got married. And then he <laughs> was the best man at our wedding and became the godfather to our kids. And it sounds more incestuous or bizarre than it is. The funny part of the story is how 
kind and included and caring that circle of the three of us has remained all through these years. It's been 25, 26 years of that circle that I'm relating. So yeah, Ken became basically just our, we formed a new kind of family. And to this day, my daughters go to his loft and he does godfather, goddaughter stuff with them. So to segue a bit from that to something you mentioned, which I think is true and beautiful and good to make a little integral wink there is the opportunity of attempting an integral approach to let's just call them the phenomena. Let's just use a big umbrella to begin with perhaps. And I'll just talk for a few minutes and then hand the baton back to you to see where you'd like us to go among this menu of options. This big umbrella of the phenomena, which could include things such as psi phenomena that Dean Radin has done so much work in advancing our understanding with. It could include remote viewing. It could include exotic abilities attained through altered states. But perhaps more precisely into the center for us today, it can also include unidentified flying objects. It can unidentified aerial phenomena, which is a new trendy vogue term for the same set of strange events and sightings. It can include contact with non-human entities, abduction, hybridization of human and non-human entities, and then a host of other really charged subsidiary experiences, which I would say include high strangeness and the truly transrational events and experiences that attend these nuts and bolts, concrete, objective craft and events as well. And that's where integral becomes really important because, pardon my French, but the biggest part of the shit show with this big umbrella of the phenomena is that it includes the transrational. And as soon as we wade into the preliminary inquiry around, holy cow, what are these truly inexplicable craft and events and entities and physical markings and well you spin the four quadrants you get all of them instantaneously the subjective awareness is a determining factor in the objective item that is seen the objective item seems to have completely inexplicable ability to apprehend and even anticipate the interior of the individual during the event in ways we don't understand at all then you have the collective manner in which our myth making and intercept intersubjective awareness is informing and coloring our perception and interpretation of events that very often do have utterly independent ontological status. It's very complex. And that's before we get into the high strangeness and the truly transrational elements. And the transrational stuff is one of the main things that has really tripped up our attempts to advance our understanding and have a civil, coherent, intelligent conversation about this, what's on the other side of the membrane, let's say. And integral, circle all the way back to that, integral is the one solid mooring. It's this tiny little embassy where the transrational is admitted as a legitimate mode of inquiry and aspect of reality. It's still messy as hell, even an integral. It's still messy for a 40-year meditation practitioner to delineate how the transrational is truly distinct from the irrational or the pre-rational. But if we don't even have that conversation, if we don't even discuss those finely sophisticated partitions, we can't really get anywhere with these enigmas. They include that. And if we don't include that, we're just never going to have a holistic encounter or certainly not a whole relationship with them. So that's where I'll just pause as like a little beginner of where integral can be important with that. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. That was, uh, there was a lot to, to unpack there, but it's true that, that um, allowing ourselves to look at these so strange uh, phenomena without um, like, judging them beforehand as as ridiculous because they are uh, irrational or transrational i mean 
I, I wouldn't say that I completely trust 100% of the people that, that, that might uh, say they were witness or participants in something that strange. But uh, I don't know, perhaps it's because of my own personal experiences and because I have in a certain way proved to myself that, that something like this is possible. Uh, it, it's, it's probably because of that that I can listen to a, a, a crazy story <laughs> or a, or a, an, an otherwise crazy story or which yeah. which my, my um i would have looked at that same story a few years back with different eyes yeah. and nowadays i can look at it and and see okay this sounds crazy on the surface but what's what's going on like uh, uh beneath the surface or right deep, deeply inside this uh this this right. phenomena yeah so two things that I would just offer uh, that arose in hearing you share that three actually one is I'd love to hear what your experiences are and um, you you perhaps have shared them in detail here and you can point me to where to find them as you and I discussed we can instead of me retelling my entire mantis odyssey which is really that's a whole thing in itself what we will point people to the documentary they can listen to get everything they need there there's plenty of sources um, so those will be in the show notes or however you like to package that. And the same with you. I would like to know your experiences every time. I have, I'm never not curious mm -hmm. when someone comes to me with non-ordinary experience. It's 100% of the time my curiosity is peaked and I would love to know. So invitation there. And then two, again, to start from a real simple set of distinctions. Real simple and we can expand on them a bit as we go forward. Number one. Fraud does exist in this umbrella. It exists sometimes in a rather robust fashion, oftentimes in a more peripheral, but still antagonizing manner of interposing itself and discombobulating people doing sincere work or attempting to. Fraud does exist. And then moving clicks over in the spectrum. Mental illness is real. Hallucinations, which are derived of mental illness, even sourced in like biological illness, uh, head injuries, just there's that itself is a florid prismatic realm to discover. So, any sensible integral response begins with acknowledgement of all of these aspects, realms, domains, and then recognizing as an extension of that the real landscape within each of them. Mental illnesses are real. The people are committing fraud. We do misperceive things that we are experiencing. And the vast majority of sightings throughout history have very likely the large majority, I would say 95%, are explicable by conventional or simply misunderstood or misperceived. That's all true. Like, admit that, step one. Beyond that, the next distinction is, we are still left with tens of thousands, and that is being conservative. Anyone with a sincere curiosity who looks deeply and looks in a sustained fashion into this part of the umbrella, craft, sightings, entities, abductions, hybridization, high strangeness, and studies the events and the witnesses and all the available evidence is going to find that we are left still with a category of completely mind-blowing fucked up shit that we don't have any satisfactory way of accounting for. But just as we make distinctions in that first partition, allowing for hallucination, mental illness, misperception, conventional explanations to explain a lot of that, over here on the side of, let's say, abduction and hybridization, I have to express one point of frustration that I have felt with Integral is that 25 years ago when I was working with John Mack and going around to conferences, John Mack being the head of psychiatry at Harvard, Pulitzer Prize winning author, worked with hundreds of abductees, and through his work came to the first point of clarity, which was mental illness and psychopathology does not account for what these people are presenting. That is not what we're dealing with. Here's someone who would really know. Here's someone who is in a very good 
rock solid position, didn't believe in abduction, didn't believe in the part of the umbrella that we were discussing, went into it to do, not necessarily to disprove it, but to find a new kind of mental illness. That's what he thought abduction would be. Instead, what he found was experiencers from across demographics, from across cultures, from across races, every vertical and horizontal location you want to give in our uh, planetary social systems. <clears throat> he found abductees and he found them presenting with very clear demarcated issues of trauma and the issues of trauma concorded with the, the sorts of events that would happen to people who are physically, sexually abused, abducted in the fashion of like human to human abduction. And also the little constellation of the high strangeness stuff, what he called ontological shock, what begins to happen to a sane person who has a wonderful place in society with a healthy family and good relationships. What happens to their world when something they don't understand or know or recognize begins to take them at will with impunity, their worldview begins to collapse. And so I just wanna draw those two ends of the spectrum, which is over here in the high strangeness where sincere abductees and experiences are going through something that's already truly traumatic and is often worldview destroying, causing ontological shock. The response from the integral community, but also the psychotherapeutic community, the medical, the, all the debunkers, to say the least, the response to that has been really awful. And we're catching up now. Generally, an integral is starting to catch up and show some really promising signs. But there's a good 20 years there where there was tens of thousands of people experiencing something that has every bit the felt reality and destructive power of normal human trauma. And they really had almost nowhere to go with it. And by the way, it wasn't just John Mack. There's a domino of clinicians, world-class clinicians that have looked into this. And the ones that have really given it fair attention admit that there's something there quite mysterious and powerful, and we don't know what to do about it. I'll pause again. I know that's a lot. I'm a talker. So if you ever want me to shut up too, just raise your hand. And I'll, <laughs> I'll just close it down. No, it's perfect. We're in a, in a talk show, so you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that, that phrase, ontological shock, right? Because I, I felt that myself. Um, there was this point when, when uh, I, I felt like I was going crazy because um, through, through experiences, mainly uh, at that time with psychedelics, um, not, not like an extreme amount, just, just a few that, that opened my, my, my mind slowly since, you know, uh, for, d during uh, a long period of several years until um, perhaps getting into, into a little bit into one of my experiences. Um, um, there's this substance called DMT mm -hmm. and I had an experience uh, where, where like moments after having um, partaken into, you know, with, the, with the substance, I, I just dropped myself uh, on the on the bed, and as I was going backwards, right as I was inclining and, and going onto the bed, the the with eyes closed, the entire everything uh, was was replaced. You know the the, the entire I was somewhere else. It's like I was teleported, but the the feeling was not of I was teleported, but everything around me was like like if you would change the the channel on a on a radio on a uh -huh. television everything around me changed and and i was suddenly in this big white space um and and in front of me the first thing that i saw was in front of me a very tall creature a uh, very tall entity i would call it um that was uh, just um putting his his hand near near me like the sense that i got was that it was trying to like lift me up or perhaps it was offering me something or showing me something i have no idea what what really if, if he did have anything on his hand i just remember his hand or its hand and and i was in in complete shock at the moment i was like um totally in my senses i wasn't like um 
drunk or drugged or you know you during the the experience you feel totally normal I and, agree. Uh, and then I, I look to the side and behind this first entity which to describe it it's like um it felt like you know this um, apple technology that it's like um fiberglass and white and and like sp sparkly or or very light you know um it, it had this kind of like some something like a, a white exoskeleton in a way that resembles this this kind of technology very minimal very and no expression in the face and completely white and then to the side i see behind it on on some kind of a wall there is a hole and inside this hole there is another one of these entities but it's just laid back totally relaxing kind of reading a book and and i get the feeling that the hole where this creature is uh, is sitting uh, if if the if the entity was to to like stand up and move away that the the the, the hole in the wall would close like intuitively i, I get this yeah. idea you know that nobody showed me or nobody said anything but right just by seeing it i knew that this had this uh, kind of property you know this material. as though the environment itself possessed sentience yeah like it would react to to whatever happened or perhaps to whatever the thoughts or the actions of of the entities inside right yes so, and i know just as a, as a as a as a, a short break in the middle of this explanation i know this sounds crazy i know i was uh inside of a um an experience that is outside of the normal and there's many, many ways of discrediting this story. I'm not saying that I necessarily believe that I was in this place or as much as, I, as it could just be like projections of my own mind of nothing or of something else which appeared to me in, in this way, right? Through my, <laughs> my own filters, right? Right. Because but it, it didn't let me feel like... like how to explain so okay so behind the, the first uh, entity there's this one on the on the wall right and it's like reading a, a book or like holding a tablet or something and then i'm again i'm totally amazed by by what i'm seeing and even behind them there's this big like um i don't know if the word is like a catwalk like um along along um a long strip where okay. hundreds or thousands of these beings are walking left and right, going this way and the other, all of them with kind of like um, iPads or something like that with tablets uh -huh. on their hands, doing stuff like important stuff. The idea I got was that, that they were like controlling something with, with, their, with their gadgets. <laughs> and then even behind them, a little bit above, at the very end of this of this space, all, all of this space was like white. At the very end, I see a giant window, a very like a horizontal long window, and outside of this window, I see space. So the darkness of space and stars. Mm. So at that moment, I'm like, okay, so I'm on a spaceship right now. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and again, I want to 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 make an, an extra. Um, uh, a clarification that I, I was totally awake at the moment. There was no alteration of my mind. Exactly, very lucid. And, and all of this at the same time that I was seeing it, um, because it was a, a first-hand experience, it felt very real and very, wow, okay, so I'm on a mm. ship, there's these entities in front of me and they, they're shoving their hands in front of me, they have their iPads. And at the same time, there's this other part of my mind saying, wow, okay, this is very creative of, of my own mind to, to have made up all of this. But then, so that, that is basically the, the, the story of, of that particular contact, right? Or, or experience. And then there's this, this, this idea that, that what I saw could be uh, an interpretation that that my own filters of my own upbringing, my own uh, uh, interpretation or, or my own likes and dislikes, my own um, 
inclinations or in, in life, uh, that, that this experience was shown through a, a kind of filter, which means that what I saw isn't necessarily what, what was, um, <laughs> like there is something perhaps inside the, the molecule that, that I consumed at the time, or something communicates through that molecule, and that it doesn't necessarily look like that, but that it has the ability of showing you uh, enough in a way of itself so as to, to, to send a particular message. You know what I mean? It's really confusing, but... but well, you know, let me play devil's advocate. Why take an either or approach as well? Because uh, to circle back with integral, one of the things it affords us is an end to the binary dominance of interpretations. This either or, it's this or that, it's objective or it's subjective. Basically, anything that arises is intrinsically endowed with the four quadrant inside, outside, individual, collective. And so in looking at or listening simply to your experience, as you began to get into the questioning of whether this was simply an exotic mode of your own creativity, which is somehow intersecting with the properties of the molecule, etc. I mean, a question I have, and I don't have the answer to it, is just why couldn't it be all of those things? Why wouldn't it be that your creativity amplified by a set of conditions and a perfect confluence of events might actually intersect with a craft and a set of intelligences that are occupying a dimensional fold that we're simply not acquainted with? and have it happen in this, they could all be true simultaneously. But I believe that we're, we inherit an intrinsic s seduction and also there's a real unspoken pressure. Uh, this gets into a fun, simple exercise, which is to look at contact from any vertical altitude and from any of the available uh, horizontal states and modalities that are available at each one of these vertical altitudes. And so one of the things you've probably noticed in sharing your own experience and that every contactee goes through some version of is that as soon as you put it out there, this happened to me, then a Rorschach blot avalanche comes back to you, which is <clears throat> you have fundamentalist Christians telling you it's all demons. You're gonna go to hell, stop interacting with those entities, it's demonic. They're trying to masquerade their way into a reality. You need to use prayer and the Bible and the church. That's a very magic, or excuse me, mythic membership. Actually, I should start with magic, magic mythic, because magic mythic altitude is already replete and ornamented with high strangeness. So in a very funny way, this truly transrational aspect of the phenomena we're discussing actually looks familiar from our worldview from 20,000, 30,000 years ago, the, the baseline worldview of the world is enchanted, the world is magic, and many ra non-rational things populate the magic worldview. And so transrational things are perfectly in accordance with what goes on. And that's a funny uh, top, bottom, I'm using that in a very general, generalized way. So then we go up to mythic membership and you have Christians telling you it's all demons and that it's, we need to invoke the Bible and it's a spiritual war between good and evil. And then you go up to the rational and you have debunkers and logisticians coming out left and right telling you this whole thing is either mental illness or it's, it's unidentified, misunderstood, natural phenomena. It, famous phrases, it's swamp gas, it's... <laughs> The pilots don't understand what it is they're interacting with. It must have been seagulls. People literally telling these Navy pilots these objects that come from 80,000 feet outside of the atmosphere to six feet over the ocean in one half of a second and move instantaneously from point A to point B and can anticipate where the pilots are going to be in three minutes. Like, 
the litany of discord between its seagulls and what they actually experienced and how highly qualified they are is one of the hilarious ways that the rational tries to deal with these inadmissible types of events and experience. Then you go up to pluralism. Pluralism has been a probably the most positive contributor among the vertical altitudes because pluralism was the first worldview to come online and say, oh, this is real. Many things are happening we don't understand. We should try to formulate a response to this. And they, for better or worse, like every altitude, like all of us humans, some of their efforts have been amazing. Some of them have been awful. Uh, Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project, amazing, getting hundreds of people on video from the government and the military to testify to the validity of these events and experiences. But then also it goes, promisingly, it begins to include consciousness, consciousness, and then it migrates over the years into what it's come become a pretty culty, unhealthy, spiritual cultish approach to proprietary approaches to human consciousness and contact with aliens that cost people a ton of money, include NDAs, and have a completely, uh, in my opinion, pathological approach to, this, to the spiritual dimension of our relationship with these entities. Also at pluralism, you get people projecting their higher selves onto these non-human intelligences and said, there are saviors, there are space brothers, they're going to stop the nuclear war, they're going to fix the environment, they're going to take over the world and everything's... <clears throat> going to be hunky-dory because they're enlightened beings clearly because their technology is so exotic and we're stupid warful humans which i often also believe is terribly misguided and absolutely untrue i don't see any ounce of evidence that we should forfeit our spiritual sovereignty and what is beautiful and powerful about the human soul that's the thing we need the most entering into relationships with non-human entities don't hand that over. Also, I don't think many of them want that. Do you want to be in a relationship with a toddler or with a fully functioning, mature, sophisticated, sentient entity? That's, that's I believe, what many of them want. So that's pluralism. But I do love pluralism because it's also the altitude that's put together communities. It, that's, it put together the conferences. They have attempted to include spirituality, consciousness. They have actually formed a community and that community has been what's allowed for an economy and a conversation. And they really, even something like to the stars Academy, I believe only has a foothold because of the pluralistic altitude of population that's providing an audience, really, who do we think is well, the majority are watching the entertainment and documentary. So, and then we get to integral, which we've talked a bit about an integral, is what I just did right now is an instance of integral, like the, the first place where we actually take a vertical view and we understand that there are perspectives at each of these developmental stages and they're all legitimate. Like again, because people get touchy about this and sensitive and there's a lot of like anti-integral backlash from certain quarters of each of those altitudes. And my opinion is like, how many of your kids do you want to keep? All your kids. You want all your children in your family. That's what we want. We want all the altitudes. Each of us is an inheritor of all of those altitudes and we can't function in a healthy way without our own vertical chain. We need every one of them. So that's another thing I think we need to get out of, which is like, well, blue is stupid and red is this and green, blah, blah. That's, that's like dead and gone. So moving forward to this more, the potential of integral in relationship to an experience like yours or an experience like mine, I think is, I lament a bit that it didn't step forward more passionately previously to plant a few flags because in the interim, other perspectives did that perhaps are less helpful in us finding a healthy whole way through this. But nonetheless, it's not too late. And these conversations and any conversations and people like Michael Zimmerman and Sean S. Bjorn Hargens and yourself and I, even Ken Wilber is willing to talk about this right now. I couldn't get him to speak about this publicly in a way that was not dismissive for 20 some years, but he's doing it now. And I'm not knocking Ken again. He's my best buddy and he, he's done more than anyone for me finding help in regards to these puzzles. 
but things are looking a lot better. And I, again, to just what I'll close with on this little diatribe-ish thing I've gone through is that I'm eager for integral to begin to unpack the transrational components in a sane way, because it's coming, whether we like it or not. Like the good news is integral did anticipate the ontological status of the transrational as an intrinsic feature of our human experience. The bad news is it's starting to show up now in a more robust fashion in our queries of this variety. And we're having a great deal of trouble with it so far. Yeah, it's I, feel, I feel like your experience is an example of the transrational. Yeah, um, it's, it's like, I really think I, in fact, I started this, this podcast and named it Mystic Times because I really think we've like entered into this, I don't know, there's many ways to, to look at it, uh, uh, a kind of metaphor or, or perhaps it's true, is that, that we've, the, the planet or the solar system is in a particular part of the universe where certain energies or certain neutrinos or whatever, I don't know, uh -huh. perhaps there is some, some, true to that, some truth to that. Yeah. I think there is like, it's, it's happening all over everything in, in a way uh, is, is as much 3D as it is every, everything else. Um, so yeah, the experience that I, that I told you about, it, it is very much something that only happened inside my mind. But at the same time, what are the limits of our mind? There's questions like that, that, that actually came up for me when, 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 um, when being in contact with experiences like that, like, and one thing we can't account for is the interior experiences of the entities that were in the environment that you interposed with. Yeah, that right? is one of the biggest questions for me. Is um, um, I, do you know about Terence McKenna? Mm -hmm. So he had this kind of question that I think he asked the mushroom once, which was, um, "What what do you look like to yourself?" Something like that was his question. <laughs> he connects that with, a, with something in, in the Bhagavad Gita where Arjuna asks Krishna to show his true form and it's something that is totally out of this world and he's actually even scared after seeing mm. every, everything that he sees in there um, because that's, and that is why we have filters in our, uh, as our human perceptions we need those filters or our brains would would, would yes. circuit probably. Um, I concur. And uh, yeah, one of the big questions is what, what are they to themselves? So do they have a, a, an eye apart from, I mean, just as much as my eye is apart from yours, which it actually, we could say it's not. But I mean, do they have this sense of I-ness, which would mean in a way that they are real entities do they are they only pre i mean i i don't i don't think to to in in the in the evolution of my thinking i've for myself i have i have um um demonstrated or or i i can accept for myself a few things that maybe i'm not very comfortable saying because right. you know how you might say something and the other person doesn't necessarily uh, understand it in the same way as you or mm. have the same dictionary thing. Right. And so I might say that they are um, entities that exist by themselves. Uh, but what does that really mean for me? I mean, I don't really think they are necessarily different. Just like when you say they, are you referring to the intelligences that were in that environment that you went to specifically? Yeah, for example, yes. Yeah, okay. Or I could I could tell you a, little, a very short one uh, that I've shared before. Um, when I was a kid, I went to to a sleepover at a friend's house, and the following morning I woke up like around. It was already uh, light, so it was probably like around six, seven, something like that, and I wake up. And there is like in front of me, there's the, the, in front of me and to the right is the door to the room. And that door um, connects with a, with a hallway and with the, the living room. So there's this place where, where I can see that, that is, it's already morning. And 
through the door from from the living room or or perhaps from the other end of the of this corridor which led to the to his parents bedroom from this door suddenly comes in a purple uh, purple smoke right like a purple cloud comes into the room and on top of the cloud there's like this size a small genie that's sitting on this on this cloud oh. and <laughs> <laughs> completely oh. insane like a cartoon genie uh, or, or not necessarily a cartoon genie because it, it I mean for myself it was really there I, I felt it its presence like if, if there was an animal there you know and it comes in on, on this cloud, walk, floats in, inside the room, looks at me, turns around and goes away into the living room and disappears uh, over there. Wow. I was shocked and, and I was young, like, I don't know, like 10, 11. So I just stayed on my bed and I know that was it for the experience. I didn't go chasing after it or anything like that. But it was very real, you know? Um, and yeah. How can we explain things like that? Because I, I hear to other people telling uh, perhaps some UFO stories feel very, feel so crazy, you know, that, okay, this is, this person is lying, for example, right? But then again, I can check with my own experiences, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't even know if my own experiences are true and I, I would be lying to say that they are, but my first person experience was very real. So what would, yeah, right? What can we do with that? Like your story well, is also very. Yeah, it is. I mean, first of all, before I get into a bit of like, what can we do with that as a question? The, I don't know the etymology of the word genie mm. and it, that being the descriptor you use or the most appropriate one available to what it was you experienced. My first question was, I wonder if genie has some touch point with gin. Yes. And it does? Yeah, that's where it's like kind of like a, a Western version of, of that. Um, okay. That, that's like that's a, what... A Muslim idea, right? Or um, Yeah, an Islamic or a Sufi. Islamic idea, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. That jinn are these intelligences that populate coextensively with us a reality located here, but not quite permeable on either end. And sometimes fact, they do. I have a friend, he's a Sufi, and he told me that he's an old guy. He's kind of like Gandalf. And, and he told me that we, we uh, let's see if I remember this correctly, but we have a, a genie that, that is born with us in a way. And, and like, like a, a kind of a twin, a genie, or a guardian angel maybe you know that they don't have a physical body but they are perhaps always with us they are like um they, they come into this world like connected to us in a way well i think that that accords with my own personal cosmology in the sense that just as the same as the human body is replete and populated with billions of organisms I think, although not quite an exact analogy, our spiritual reality and dimension, our native spiritual self is a choir. It's not, not so much an individuated, solitary, monolithic self or a subject. It is a very rich ecosystem of sorts. And you really have to begin to ask ourselves, we could think of the genie that's born with us, the jinn that may cohabitate certain dimensional overlays in our reality, but also things such as, to get back to integral, the altitudes within our own self. We are each of those altitudes. It is really not that someone outgrows the red power drive of their young life when you're or when you're coming up and you're simple things like i have to fight for food i need shelter i need sleep i need comfort makes it like there's a part of us that needs those things there's a part of our heart that cries for connectivity love compassion there are parts of us that is truly cosmic and transcendent and we can make a very nuanced and layered 
list of all of the, you can call them aspects if you want, but sometimes those aspects present themselves as strongly defined personifications. And so it is possible, and I don't think a sign of mental illness necessarily for an aspect of ourselves to interact with us, our higher self perhaps intervening at a crucial crucial moment in order to prevent us from making a big karmic life mistake. Simple ones like I'm horny, I need to have sex, like that's, all of those voices are legitimate, real, and needed and included. And I would say any legitimate look at the ontological richness of our cosmos and just planet Earth, whether we're looking at a dog or a non-human bipedal intelligence that seems to be interacting with us through dimensions, we have to understand, like bring it, we actually don't have to understand, but I think our opportunity in Integral is to understand if we bring it all to the table, all of it, and understand that, yes, it's true. I might have had a hallucination in which an aspect of myself manifest in an apparent 3D fashion in a room as a non-human intelligence, and then created a bit of theater which shot me full of what was a completely compelling and believable experience. Like, that is possible. That's probably happened a lot. Maybe that's the explanation for some fairies and gnomes or some of the more uh, dark stuff with Missing 411. But also, it's pretty nuts to look at hundreds of years, hundreds of years of all of these types of non-human entities and tens of thousands of instances and to narrow it really tightly to within the abduction phenomenon where you have a pattern of clues, a pattern of experiences, events and incidences over decades, lifetimes and actually what we know now is generations, bloodlines. And so you have to account for, well, this family has seen craft on 12 or 13 occasions and they have missing time on four occasions and there are scoop mark scars and implants in their body that have been removed and analyzed and they contain an isotopic signature that really doesn't make any sense for what our current science is it makes sense from something off world they have conscious recall waking recall in daytime of having entities take them before they lost consciousness 30 seconds into it i mean i could sit and talk about this for hours the evidence of these clues does not comport with something purely manufactured by the creative capacity of an individual when you factor in that these are shared experiences among a bunch of people it doesn't add up and all i'm saying in the integral sense is like we have to ask the fair questions. First, you got to look at all that data. You've got to open-mindedly, open-heartedly look at some of these cases like that, and there are thousands. Once you've gotten through all that and we see what's contained in there and how vertical and horizontal and the high strange and the physical, then we can start to ask these questions. Given our methodological pluralism, what are some helpful ways we can form a team get all our best intelligences together in our human team and start to try to help these people because they have serious problems. And we, in my opinion, as a species are going to have a serious problem. Right now, I think one thing that's happening that I don't feel excited about is that the vast majority of intelligent conversation around UAP and aliens and UFOs is taking place from the Pentagon and the Navy and the DOD and organizations that are populated by former CIA agents. And I don't hate any of those people and I don't want them to suffer any malaise, but that's the militarization of the enigma. And what we're seeing is a power slide because this is a serious real thing and those organizations recognize it's slipping out of their hand in some fashion. They're making a move to ensure that they control all of the real estate that is possible to control among these phenomena. Now, I, th I think there's still a shit ton of wild cards because these entities themselves are not beholden to those agencies. And these entities themselves, many of them operate with total impunity. And whatever, whatever it is they're trying to achieve, they're achieving it. They're obtaining their objectives and they don't need humans to do it. That much I think is pretty obvious early on when you get into the weirdness of it all. So I kind of babbled on uh, your point there, but it's just, 
nice to be able to vent in an integral fashion <laughs> a little bit, you know? They don't seem to need humans, you say, but at the same time, there is this um, intuition for me that why even uh, contact humans? Why? I misspoke. And, and at yeah, the same, I agree with you. At the same time, how different um, or how much, this is one of these questions that I, I still don't know how to ask really, but I base, I base lots of my, of, my, um, of my metaphysical understandings on, on Hinduism or, or, or the Vedantic ideas and Buddhism. Yeah. And so the, the ideas that they use are very helpful, I think. Um, there, there's this idea of Brahman, right? The, the absolute existence. And, 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 and in a way, we could, we could say that it kind of divides infinitely into infinite beings. So in a way, everything or who we are deeply and truly and in our essence, in our nature, is the same as any strange entity from any dimension, from any galaxy, from, or with any form and name. And yes. any, everything in the end is, is the same. Yes. So, so the question is how much, I don't know, how much of a, of a free will perhaps these, these uh, strange entities that we might encounter in psychedelics, in magic rituals, in, in, in hallucination, in dreams. Yeah. Um, perhaps even when you, you go around the corner at night and suddenly you, you happen to, 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 to bump into uh, <laughs> one of the weirdest things that you might experience in your life, just yeah. a chance. And how much do they exist by themselves? I don't know really how to ask this question. Mm. Uh, I think they're beautiful questions. And first, let me correct something that I said preceding what you just shared there. I said they don't need humans to obtain their objectives. Actually, they definitely clearly, if they don't need us, they very much want us. I believe they do need us because they are going to great trouble and great pains and great inconvenience to spend decades interacting with us in an utterly intimate fashion. So what I meant was, they don't need the Pentagon. They don't need the Department of Defense. They don't need the Navy. They need humans and they have all the humans they need and they have access to us in the manner in which they desire. So what I was more trying to delineate was the Pentagon may be making chess moves because it feels its hand being forced in some fashion or it, <clears throat> or it may be playing a form of chess that we can't even anticipate. It's making moves with something planned further out that we don't have a notion of. That's taking place to a large degree independently of what these entities are trying to obtain through a very sustained program. And they're going to do that as they always have without being interrupted or disturbed in any serious degree, at least from everything we've seen thus far. So just to clarify, because I misspoke on that. And then Ontologically, you, you meant a mention in some fashion of, I don't know, do they exist when I'm, when I'm not around? I mean, for my own personal, where I have arrived at this point, which is still in flux, which is still in motion, I feel very, very clear that the mantid entity that I have had interactions with, it very much exists when I don't think about it and when I'm not around, and it will exist after I die. It may still <laughs> exist when I'm born into my next lifetime. But I love that you brought in these sacred mystical texts and the esoteric and great mystical traditions of our world, because this is another point that I have been more and more trying to assert in combination with the conversation about UFOs and aliens and non-human entities, is that our, um, our spiritual sovereignty and the source and origin of all life, which is our native endowment. Each human being is born into this lineage in which we are unique, discrete souls who also paradoxically in the most elegant fashion are completely conjoined to that which gives birth to everything and which everything dissolves into. That's what we get for free when we're born. Now there's nothing in my experience or view more 
powerful, magical, mystical, and precious than that in the sum total of the cosmos. And I have to, with you in this conversation, because you're a practitioner and these are your native realms, I would say also that I think this is an important aspect of non-human and human contact because in some entities, in some instances, I think there's been an atrophy or a loss of something approximating what I just related that you and I share, that we are born as an endowment as humans with our sovereignty and limitless capacity to realize the spiritual heritage of the cosmos. I think they've lost some of that, some of them. And one of the reasons they are so desperately, intimately, magnetically drawn to us is they're trying to understand that. They're trying to recover that. Or in some instances, they're trying to manipulate that because they don't understand it, actually. And so far be it from me feeling like um, that because some non-human intelligence shows up with such exotic technology and an ability to manipulate the laws of physics in ways we don't understand, oh, they can move through walls. They can stop and start time. They completely have telepathic interface with a collective in a fashion we have no comprehension of. They must be enlightened. No, that makes as much sense as saying, oh, humans invented the nuclear bomb. They must be awake now because they control that degree of atomic explosive power. They're totally disjunctive. The technology is not spirituality and spirituality is not technology. And I do understand how intoxicating it is because I've seen craft do things that are fucking impossible. I've witnessed it and so have members of my family and we've seen it together. I understand what it is to see events that are inexplicable and feel like, holy shit, who and what figured out how to do that? What did I just see? But when that wears off and you get back to what you and I just discussed, when you sit down in meditation and you feel this incredible gift that our human soul has, which is the infinite mystery of all mysteries, nothing surpasses that from all the lineages, from all the paths. And so that's what I feel we need to hold on to and strengthen when we begin this little adventure of like, okay, something is interacting with us. Something intelligent is here. I don't know where it's from. I don't know what it's trying to achieve, but it's real and it's here and it has properties we don't, but we have properties it doesn't. It's the one knocking on our door all the time, right? I mean, look at these things. They're just constantly knocking and knocking. And maybe it would be interesting for you now to talk about <clears throat> how to respond to knocking to the attempt for contact being made to a lot of contact deductees experiencers, which is to develop a banishing ritual, to develop modes of protection, to use your spiritual practice as a way to hermetically seal your life and your family's life so that when you make a move, it's a choice. It's not, I got paralyzed, I got abducted, or I got, you know, and I'm not saying I have a way for all abductees to not get abducted. I'm just saying I have a practice in my life, which is to call in my ancestors, my guides, and my allies every day and hermetically seal every member of my family, just as like a basic behavior, like washing your hands or getting enough sleep, right? So I want to ask you about that part of your life. Has it evolved? What does it include? Yeah, it's very important, I think, what you're saying. Mm. I, I'm, I, I try to, to keep in mind, it's, it, it, it gets so subtle, you know, when we, when we start delving into these topics and realms and ideas, because uh, th there is something about language that, that helps us, but at the same time confuses us. Uh, we, we sometimes think that language has the answer to answer the question, but perhaps the question is, is uh, translinguistic or whatever you would like to call it. So, uh, so <laughs> connecting to, to like um, banishing rituals, for example, or, or talking and, and invoking angels or, or whatever um, the person might feel comfortable with, I think that is very important as a concept. But then there is also the, 
the subtlety of, of your intention. So if you're doing that because you're scared that something bad might happen to you, in a way you're also calling the, the something bad to happen. Yeah, yeah. So doing it from a place of, of trust and, and openness, of, of a receptive thing. Like for, ex for myself, I don't always do uh, banishing rituals or like um, very consciously like invoke something. I am more of like, I, I feel safe. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm, like I am protected. I know I am protected. So, so it's not something that, oh, uh, for example, I had this contact with a particular entity in, in, a, in a DMT experience. So after the experience, I'm going to, to, to seal um, all, all my energies because they are not and I am uh, in, in danger of, of some uh, disturbance or something. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if it's, I mean, who, who knows exactly how correct or not it is to, 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 to do it one way or the other. I think that the, the most important is that, that awareness of being, of being safe, of being, of being, of being held by the universe. You know, not that it's bad to, to do uh, banishing rituals or to, or to, or to, Every now and then, I will uh, um, consciously and, and because of whatever, I, I feel like, okay, I, I would like to, to, to reinforce the shield or whatever. Mm -hmm. because, but not because I feel it's weak, but be because I sense that it needs um, a boost or something like yes. that. You know what I mean? Yes. Completely. And that's such a great nuance that you brought in there because I completely agree in these good conditions and good situations. And actually I a bit mischaracterized my practice because I don't do banishing every day, but I do shielding every day. And I do, it's something that's just a constituent part of my 24 hour cycle. It's like I brush my teeth, I'll eat some food. I'm going to drink water, going to exercise, going to meditate, going to shield. It's just a component of how I like to organize my spiritual environment. And so I, banishing is a bit more of a precision tool for certain situations. And this is also probably a little bit more on the spiritual side of things than the, than the uh, mystery of the phenomenon and what's been transpiring in the news with craft recently. But I think it's one that I'm hopeful will become more present because I, along with you, one of the things I discovered as I went through, you know, I've been practicing Zen for, I guess about, it's been 25 plus years. That's evolved in some other modes of meditation. But only recently did I get into a real <clears throat> fundamental inclusion of joy and gratitude and humor as these indispensable properties of spiritual life and practice and how just sitting down and being so grateful and going inside and thanking and being specific, and then importantly offering to serve in love, serve that goodness for no quid pro quo, not expecting anything in return. It's like, show me some good things I can do today in service of love and kindness and consciousness and healing. <clears throat> That's the main mode for sure. And I think that another nuance that I would like to tease out in relationship to these phenomena and that specific part of the umbrella we began with is that <clears throat> pardon me then there's a little bit of a different set of circumstances for instance i work with a lot of experiencers and i'm certified in transpersonal hypnosis and i'm a death doula but also just as a spiritual practitioner and primarily as an artist oops Please, sorry, did, uh, I, uh, did uh, i cut um, out yeah when you were saying the um... Uh, no, I, I forgot, but when you, okay. you were starting with this explanation. Yeah, so I work with uh, experiencers, abductees, contact, contactees, sometimes using transpersonal hypnotherapy, uh, also end-of-life work that I learned as a death doula, but more generally just as an artist and a, a member of the creative lineage that includes all of our spiritual lineages and all of our arts and 
seeing that as the primordial spiritual path, really, that gave rise to all the other ones, which is true even historically. So the nuance I wanted to bring to the previous part of our conversation around how our good locus of happiness and gratitude and joy is such a strong determining factor, that's all true. But then I also know of and work with a lot of people who don't have that set of conditions. They have trauma, fear that they're going to lose their job, their relationships are falling apart, depression, the list is just very long. And that's a different set of conditions. And it won't work for me to just tell someone, listen, you just really got to stay in gratitude all the time. You know what I mean? And I know that's not what you're saying. I just want to include this piece out of respect for those people, because there are now a population of people who've lived through high strangeness events and transrational experiences that include trauma and they need to heal and finding the right set of modalities and methods for them can sometimes be pretty sophisticated or it can sometimes take some time. And it's, it's as unique as the individual, of course. And to me, it includes everything from shamanic work, creative work, um, trauma work, all of those things are possible. And I just want to, I just wanted to mention that because there's also this thread in ufology that it's, it's not a huge one, but it's vocal sometimes. And it's this idea, I've seen it expressed literally this way on Twitter. If you're having bad experiences, it's because you have a bad attitude. It, and they mean, they meant, if you're having bad experiences with bad aliens, it's because you have a bad attitude. If you have good experiences with benevolent aliens, it's because you have a good attitude. I've literally seen that written. And you know, like you and I discussed, I think our personal power and our subjective claiming our sovereignty, holding on to our potent grounding and source of all things spiritually, those are super important and I emphasize them. But also it's cruel and incorrect to tell a person without knowing what they've even experienced that if it's bad, it's because they have a bad attitude. That's terrible. Would you say that to a Holocaust survivor? It just makes no sense at all, right? So they're both true. And I like to say with integral, I, that's all true. Yes, I think um, I, I am part of what I was trying to say as well is that it's so important to to have the right mindset and of course if if you've been through trauma and and especially if you haven't uh, been able to to perhaps integrate that experience into your being um, it will be very hard for you to naturally carry this this mindset of gratitude of safety of of being held yeah. so of course in in those cases it's it's all, all these kind of uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not an expert as well on, on banishing or, in, or magic in particular. I am. But all, all of the, the possible ways that one can, can, can protect oneself psychologically, uh, energetically, emotionally, all of those things are in a way um, kind of, you know how when you, when you are playing as a child and you say, okay, let's play like we are doctors or let's play like we are police and, and thief or whatever. You get into the role and then you psychologically and emotionally, you feel that way. So in a way, all these kind of rituals, what they are is a, an opportunity for us to get into the role, into uh, kind of um, embodying uh, a certain archetype or a certain way of being and, and, and presenting ourselves to, to the world and to our own selves even. Uh, like we are that powerful uh, energy that we're calling in. And so we, we don't get necessarily a, a, an invocation to, to an angel uh, because that angel is something that is necessarily only outside of myself and it needs to come here when I call it to, to protect me. But so that I think I am protected. And if I think oh. I'm protected, I am protected. Something like that. Oh. <laughs> There's this phrase from, from Buddha. I think it's from Buddha, who knows, that says, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. 
Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it calls to mind for me, this simple image of when you've not been on the cushion for a long time, uh, let's just say if my practice has fallen into dormancy and then you just don't feel that spark and enchanted presence animating your body and your mind that you might when you're really in a sweet spot with your meditation. But nonetheless, first thing you have to do is sit down. You have to just sit down on the cushion. You don't want to. You're not enjoying it. It sucks. But your body takes that form, that asana, you actually sit your butt down and then you just, even though you're not doing it, you're doing it and you're just (laughs) sitting there and it's just like, it takes time, might take a day, two or five, but eventually the confluence begins to move back into its natural circulation and you do again arrive back. But there's this period of, you're not really doing it, doing it, but you're doing it and it's that, Practice, that's why we call it practice, because even practicing positive thought, gratitude, a sense of humor, trying for a punchline and a a laugh when you feel depressed, I believe actually is one of the more beautiful, inventive human technologies is when we're in a very dark place, dark humor has this incredible, spontaneous ability to put us in this its own unique kind of altered state, which is this laugh. We're always laughing before we understand why we're laughing. No one's, you know, I shouldn't say no one. Very seldom do we sit down, analyze, get through the reason why a joke is funny. And that's like, you laugh, and then later on you think, why did I laugh? And when I've been in depressed uh, periods of my life, that's been one of the really important spiritual rescue teams has just simply been laughter. So, yeah, I like what you shared. Yeah, very much. Um, and I, I was, I was thinking, I was thinking of a stupid joke. Uh, do you know the joke about the the lion? He has a a turtle as a as an interpreter because uh, he has this this tournament. Uh, and so animals have to come and tell a joke to to the turtle, <laughs> and whoever makes it laugh, or actually, if they don't make it laugh they the lion eats them so okay, okay. So comes a, the monkey tells tells a joke the turtle very serious again okay the lion eats the monkey so another animal comes and again the turtle nothing nothing several animals they all nothing they get eaten eventually i don't know the the snake comes to tell a joke <laughs> and suddenly before the the snake even starts the turtle begins laughing and laughing and laughing hysterically. Oh my God, the monkey's joke was so great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I've never heard uh, that. <laughs> and so <laughs> this, this um, idea of, of joy and gratitude, of course, very much, because I mentioned before this, uh, the idea of Brahman, and Brahman, they describe it as uh, existence consciousness and bliss so mm. i, I listen to to those three descriptors and i totally see myself in that yeah. Not, yeah. not myself necessarily as a person and that is where language kind of make, uh, plays a trick on us because when i say i sometimes i mean i the body or i the mind or i the personality yeah. but sometimes when i say i i mean i the whatever beyond behind language the the thing that is experiencing through my eyes through my thoughts uh, and, and 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 having a, a great time during this conversation and even uh, observing the 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 joy that's going on right this yeah. thing that is ineffable in, in the end and which is our essence it's yeah it. <laughs> that's beautiful It also reminds me, are you familiar with my constructed language is? So what you just related, which are these layers of the self, these registers of the self, where sometimes uh, if we were to say, I'm afraid, we might be referring to 
physical fear. We could be referring to emotional fear, psychological fear, existential, spiritual fear. So this constructed language is actually declined and conjugated in a way in which you can say precisely that. You could say just fear, but you could also with the same single word indicate seven different registers of fear with a precision that would let the person know you're specifically referring to emotional fear or whatever it is. And um, it just emerged as a creative play thing like any of these others we're talking about. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually looking for, for a, an image if, to see if I can uh, share the screen because yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. I was, I was looking at, at this one, uh, there's this, you, you use the, the crow symbol very much. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there is some something that that you like about that's it. That's my that's my totemic animal. Mm. And it gets yeah. partly back to humor. Um, you know, I I to stay even in contact with high strangeness and aliens and UFOs. I think one thing that gets missed sometimes, or perhaps often, is that there's a lot that's funny about it. There's a lot just to begin with the the way that many of these entities are not good at some of their jobs and the ways that they the ways that they fumble um attempts to they telegraph the way in which we in which they're perceiving us so as to say what aliens imagine human beings to be like ends up being a, a hilarious joke and some of these very tense situations where they're trying to convince people to do things for certain reasons, or they're trying to calm people, or they're invoking symbology. And sometimes a very funny one is like there, there was a period where they would show up adorned in human clothing and it would never be right. Like they, they tr would try to dress as a clown thinking that would somehow placate a child and it terrified the child or they would use symbols that they would think would be emotionally important to us. And there's just all these instances, oh, also of them completely screwing up returning people. So they put the wrong clothes on the wrong people or they put shirts inside out or something really simple. Like instead of putting a kid back in a crib, they'll leave them on the steps. There's a lot in the high strangeness and transrational part of it that's just hilarious <laughs> and actually, brings us back to you and I looking at our dog or our cat mm. and trying sincerely to understand how does, an, how does anthropomorphic consciousness understand non-anthropomorphic consciousness? Mm. Can it understand non-anthropomorphic consciousness? How much of anthropomorphic consciousness is anthropomorphic versus just consciousness, if you see what I mean, which is like there's a part of me that perhaps is not characterized by being a bipedal, self-reflexive hominid. There might be a part of me that's been, let's just imagine, maybe I was a buffalo and maybe I lived on a different planet. Maybe I spent eons in which I did not incarnate in a corporeal form at all. And so it's, it's open to inquiry whether now as Stuart Davis, there's not some component of my consciousness that's truly not anthropomorphic. And might that part of my mind and being be able to comp perfectly comport with the dogs? I have spent a lot of time eye to eye with my dog, a lot, attempting some kind of Vulcan mind meld, <laughs> right? Have you done this? Yes, have yes. Have you tried that? Yeah. It's it's really hard. For example, with the cat, I've 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 come to see that that um, she doesn't really like, or or I, I'm guessing it's similar with most cats. I read that uh, looking straight into their eyes, they feel kind of threatened. They they think that it's that it's like you're trying to like you're preying on them, like you're about to hunt them or something. So yeah. I've I've learned that looking at her and and blinking my eyes. There's there's a moment when she lets her her defenses down and she blinks back. Have wow. you had that experience too? That's interesting. Yeah, try my dog. 
my dog will stare into my eyes forever. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't ever tire of it. He's a deep gazer, but my cat is just like you described. Mm. The cat is very selective about when it will interact, how it will interact, and when it, it, when it shows affection, it really will only show affection. It'll tolerate me, it'll show affection to my wife and my daughters. Mm -hmm. And it does not tolerate the dog either, obviously. No, <laughs> poor dog. <laughs> but cats, and at the same time, they are so um, so mysterious that that you want to to play with them, but then they have very very marked limits of okay. Yeah. This, I like uh, my cat likes at the at the back of the of the of the spine, let's say near the tail, mm -hmm. but not so much on the tummy, for example. The tummy mm -hmm. is very delicate for her. So she, she won't like that. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, everyone wants to be a part of a club that they're not allowed to be a part of, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. as, a, as a man, I'm not allowed to be a part of the cat club. So of course, that looks attractive and seems amazing. Um, I'm looking here to see if I can screen share because, um, let me see, right here, I think I can do this. Because yeah, can you see it? The um, Yep, that's what a crow I, painting. I, yeah, what I remember about it is that it's painted with like the letters of this language that you created, right? Yeah, so how these are put together is that first I write a poem. Typically, I'll get a commission from someone and they'll say, I'd like an original work. And then I write a poem in this language about them, their spiritual life, whatever is uniquely important in going on in their life. I do a, I guess you could call it uh, Corvidmancy, Crowmancy maybe it is. Um, so I'll do a session of meditation just asking the painting and asking the language because I believe in an animistic approach. I take an animistic approach which is granting personhood to artworks, to the presences in nature, to my dog, I grant personhood to the painting and then ask for it to have a conversation with me. Then I write a poem in this constructed language. And then I go to, when painting the bird, like the one we just saw, then that poem is infigured into the plumage of the crow. And that's how those are put together. And that's primarily what that language has become. Uh, I paint with it. I also painted a mantis painting I'll send you later on. Um, and some other ones. And then I also use it in my meditation practice for the last couple of years. I've been doing a practice with the goddess Psyche, and that language is used in some of the recitations with her. Uh, but that's pretty much it, really. Yeah, we could get totally into into this this bizarre or, or strange language that you that you created and how how you use it uh, at some other at some other conversation because it, it yeah. feels like a very deep and and just the fact that you can, I think you can read it from, from one side to the other and from the other to the one, yeah? Uh, yeah, it's directional. So every word has four, actually, directions. Uh -huh. uh, they're invert, invertible and it's vertical. So it has these horizontal and vertical features. Uh -huh. But we, yeah, I agree, we could talk about it another time because that's kind of its own point of inquiry. Yeah. Can, can you give me just one second? Yeah, take your time. And we're back. Thank you, Stuart, for, for holding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the paintings are a very interesting aspect of this broader spiritual creative integration of lineages, which I have gotten into more deeply in the past four years. And in a general sense, I call it something from nothing. And we had touched on briefly in passing what I would call the primordial lineage. And the primordial lineage is really simply just creativity itself. This is a notion that I happened upon. I certainly didn't invent it, obviously, but I happened upon it a little later in life in my 40s. After going through decades of Zen, uh, Zen Buddhism and lots of other everything from Sufism to Kashmir Shaivism to contemplative Christianity. I'm generally interested in any interior mode of mystical practice. And so 
surprisingly, in an ironic fashion, later on in my life, I realized that creativity itself is actually the oldest lineage that exists. And when I got ruminating on my cosmology, I understood, well, since the moment there has been anything, since there's been something at all, it only ever has been creative. There has never been the duplication of any two moments, any two senses. As the, they say in Buddhism, you can't put your foot in the same river twice. That doesn't exist. All that is open and available to us is creativity. We either participated in it consciously or unconsciously, actively or passively. And when I noticed that and thought, wow, the universe has been ceaselessly unfolding in this infinitely creative fashion, then human uh, our planet, human beings, every form of life that's ever existed, it's just infinitely creative. And so this is the primordial lineage. The oldest originating point of anything is itself creativity. The universe itself is creativity. And when I had this very late in life Satori of sorts, I thought, oh my God, I've been in this lineage my whole life. And art is why... I feel such a burning passion for all of these divergent modes of creative expression, whether it's music or painting or poetry, dance. My, my daughters are dancers and my wife is a dancer and TV, film, anything you name, but also just the fascinating practice of tracing my roots in that sense back to the cave painters in Chavot and the art that was on the Australian continent 60, 100,000 years ago. And then understanding that, wow, um, I wonder what the first person felt experience was of someone depicting these bison 40, 50,000 years ago in these caves in France. And the more that I ruminated on that, it's just speculation because I can't ever really know in that empirical materialist sense. However, some of the clues we have are that that was really a matter of life and death. That whatever bison were to a human being walking around 50,000 years ago in France, they could be fucking deadly. And they also could be deadly not only in how dangerous and wild they are and large, but also that if, if you didn't eat them, you might starve and die. And so you can really early on, you begin to feel that the signifiers, the felt experiences around the first art that was being depicted carried with it this life and death fucking struggle that was the reality of an everyday experience. And then you couple that with the incredible, beautiful, sophisticated manner in which they depicted all of these creatures. It's stunning. It's such a an high order of vision right out of the gate, so to speak. We could speculate and say there may have been art for hundreds of thousands of years. There probably was. We don't have access to it. And so for us, this is, but here's the funny thing about it. I, I think in a way it was really, that's when they hit the ground running. That's when there was this almost like a little Cambrian explosion of creativity. What I learned in looking deeply into these cave paintings, for instance, is that they were synchronous. They were coextensive in the timeline with the arrival of this gene called the D allele. And I'm not a genetics expert. I'm going to share with you what I've learned as an artist who's trying to look into creativity as a spiritual tradition and understand its origins and early features. So what I found out was that in Mongolia, uh, sometime around between 40 and 60,000 years ago, there was the arrival of this D allele gene in the genetic profile of the human being. And that particular gene is tied directly to creativity. And when it arrived, this explosion in creativity happened for human beings, including these cave paintings that we're referring to. And I'm bringing them up for a special reason. I'll get to it in a minute or two. I learned of the D allele gene through Richard Dolan's uh, day-long presentation, which you can find by going to richarddolanmembers.com. Just do a simple search on that site. You'll find the presentation. You'll find the book and the genetic researcher who 
forwarded this work, promulgated it. And in a nutshell, she said, now, I don't know, and no one knows where the D-allele gene came from. For a long time, it was supposed that it came from Neanderthals or from another of the coextensive hominids at that time, but no one really knew. And now, my understanding at present is that those have been ruled out. And so people from within the very deep quarters of deep research, uh, they have a theory now that possibly what may have happened is that gene was inserted and it was inserted as a developmental driver, specifically creativity. And so within the framework of Richard Dolan's presentation, that's the premise that possibly non-human entities inserted this because we've been messed with in some fashion, genetically and biologically and psychologically and spiritual, our entire existence, not the last century or two. So the reason to go back to the cave paintings is that as soon as you see this gene inserted, you see shit exploding all over the world, creatively, artistically. And within these caves, these brilliant artists, our forebears, showing us amazing visionary work tied into life, death, existence, struggle, our great vulnerabilities as human beings. Painting at that time was the, had to be the biggest fucking deal there was. Painting was such a precious resource. We're talking about something like, if it went up on the wall, it had to be profoundly felt important as a part of life and death and the very meaning of existence. So why is all that interesting to me? Because there's also UFOs on those walls. There are also UFOs. That's my interpretation, but it's a pretty broadly, I believe almost anyone would agree with me and they're free to look. I'll give you the link to see these glyphs. They exist in the same caves with the bison and the ibex and the bears and but they're separated and removed. So in another part of the cave, you find flying saucers that are landing and an entity standing in front of them and the rise and the fall. Uh, I could actually probably send you, I wonder if I have the link, I could send it during the chat. Um, the article is from Amy Michelle, who's a very famous French UFO researcher, went to the caves in person, to, uh, cataloged all the glyphs, and he puts together this really interesting, I believe it's maybe 10 or 12 pages, but it has all the glyphs inside of it. Oh my God, the Egyptian God has finally arrived. That's amazing. She was misbehaving and still is trying, trying to open the, <laughs> the bags with my food. Give me a second. <laughs> no worries. Oh my God, today we have the interruption podcast. We're going to have this the, the zoo the podcast. <laughs> Let's do our next one in the zoo. Sorry? We'll do our next episode in the zoo. Oh, that would be great. Can you imagine? So, yeah. yeah, so to bring that whole thing full circle to mm -hmm. being in these caves and knowing how important and profound what was depicted, how that was selected, that was a big deal. That was the equivalent of like, passing legislation in Washington D's that as terms of that society and that culture, these were very important symbols, clearly. So the fact that they also depicted flying saucers, some people will dispute it, but I don't think, I, I think you could show these glyphs to a five-year-old and they would say that's a flying saucer. That's how obvious it is. So coupling those two things, obviously the researcher who initially in the 80s put forward this work with depicting all these glyphs and cataloging them. His name is Amy Michel. He worked closely with Jacques Vallée. Amy Michel is kind of a French legend and ufology and wonderful guy. I'll supply that article for anyone to read and look at, do the comparisons themselves. But the point being, the trisection of the animals that they were living and dying with and, and surviving on eating, but also sometimes killed them to these absolutely bizarre craft that com per com perfectly comport with so many of the flying saucer events. And then the third one being the advent of creativity 
depiction itself. There were no signifiers before this. We have to remember that human history <laughs> was without a referent. We had no reference for the most of our existence. We had no signifiers. So depiction itself did not exist until this fulcrum. And I'm possibly, I'm not asserting this is the exact moment depiction was incepted, but it's quite possible and it does accord with the arrival of the DLL gene and all that. So on the whole, at this point, we get ourselves into a big mystery, a big magnetic enigma, which is the manner in which creativity is fundamental to the cosmos and then the manner in which we as artists are braided into non-human intelligences, possibly as long as there has been human existence itself, but certainly as long as there's been art itself. Okay, that was a mouthful. I yeah, the, the very existence of the idea of the muse, um, and, and you, you mentioned uh, the Corvid Mansi, which is not to be confused with Covid Mansi. <laughs> yes, they're quite different. But when, when you connect with, um, within yourself with the, with the, with the totem animal, um, or when you're looking into your dog's eyes and you're trying to communicate, in, in that moment, you are connecting and we are connecting with, when we are looking at, at when we are doing those practices, we are connecting with that, with that, we are communicating with, with that part of consciousness, which is uh, not limited to our filters, our, our vessel, our body, right? We are communicating with, I don't know, perhaps a part of, of the mind that is shared and, and that speaks, speaks in images like, like these paintings, speaks in, in symbols. Um, and, and I think those, those caves that you were mentioning and, and the advent of such creativity, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. Um, I, I, I don't know how much it, it could be that, that there is a, a, a physical modification of our genome and an insertion like physically, but at the same time, why not? And yeah, it's, it, all of this stuff that we're talking about, we, we're really, uh, I think it's, it's sort of cutting edge, all these type of conversations, because we have so many questions and so little answers that it, it kind of shows that we are exploring an area that, that, uh, that needs more exploring even. And, yeah, I totally and that agree. And a valid place of, of exploration because because of the subjective experience of, of the weird, of the, of the phenomenon that, that you mentioned, of, of this umbrella. Because if, if other things are objective. So here comes science with, with its hammer, with its uh, Geiger counter or whatever, and, and with its ruler, and okay, this exists because here we go. But then there is this subjective experience which you cannot measure in a in a traditionally scientific way. And I think in part this, this new age of Aquarius we're moving into, uh, it's, and, and these conversations and the rise of, of mystical think, I would call it mystical thinking. I don't know if within the, the integral um, uh, view that would be correct, but I, I call it mystic. But all this that is rising, this new way of, of seeing, it's helping us Kind of bridge spirituality and science or you know that that that's um, learning how to to explore and and understand and perhaps even study and prove the the, the validity and the existence of the outer as well as the inner we're starting to find ways to and we're starting and it seems that the conclusion and the the shock at the end of, of this is that the outer and the inner are indifferent. The outer uh, physical and the inner perhaps astral or psychological. That in a certain way, ev yeah, as we were saying, everything is one, is, everything is existence. Yes. So crazy. Yes, beautiful. And yeah, in a very simple sense, 
some of what we're coming up against right now in non-ordinary, weird, high strangeness, et cetera, that we're gonna have to resolve is rather simple. And I would describe it this way. When you get the empirical method, which is to study objective reality in a replicable fashion and develop knowledge in accordance with those protocols. That's good. I want that to exist. As I said, every altitude is a part of us. I possess the rational, I possess the logical, I'm grateful for it and I want those faculties. There are no bad faculties. So the capacity to measure and observe physical phenomena is valuable. What isn't valuable is when that methodology then becomes so strident and stringent and oversteps and then says, if it's not physical, it's not real. There's where we have a problem because interiors are real. Like, it's funny that you have to say this these days, but you do sometimes. Interiors exist in a flat out fundamental of the physical sciences is that they are physical. They are objective. That does not mean that subjective reality does not exist. And that them saying that if it's not objective and it can't be measured and it can't be replicated, then it is not real and doesn't deserve our serious study. We lose half of the cosmos every time they make that move. The universe is possibly even bigger on the inside. A human being certainly is. And so I have no beef with empiricism, as long as it's staying within its lane. It's no healthier for someone to say, you know what, rocks don't exist, everything is the fabrication of subjectivity, it's all just your subjective imagination. Throw a rock at one of those people when they're saying that, it will hurt, the, <laughs> the rock will hurt your head. Like, what I, hope for and envision, and I think a lot of us are intuitively migrating toward, is that we get this methodological pluralism, a healthy methodological pluralism, which knows we need our hard sciences, which knows that psychology is legitimate, which knows that the data on reincarnation and near-death experience has become absolutely overwhelming. And we have to have a fair conversation around that because interiors are real spiritual modes of inquiry of all the lineages. So that's just to underline and celebrate that last thing you shared, which is like the, the insides and the outsides, man, they're on the same team. We're all one team, the insides and the outsides. We don't want them fighting. Like, let's, let's get tandem. For some reason, I don't know, it's like we understand, or, or we as a, as a collective um, humanity, we understand the existence of the interior but we deny or, or we limit so much the extent to which it um, interacts or, or, um, or can modify the outside, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yes. okay, so you, you had an experience with, a, with an entity uh, when you were uh, dreaming and it told you something and the, the following day it happened. It's a coincidence. I mean, it's impossible that what happened to you uh, uh, could be correlated with something that happened after. That would be the, like the, perhaps the, the, the empirical or the scientific or scientific mm -hmm. view uh, today. But we, the, even through a scientific uh, prism, when has it been demonstrated that the limits of the inside influencing the outside are X? It hasn't been demonstrated. So it shows uh, a, a personal opinion in that sense, or, a, or an unscientific way of thinking that, okay, because this is true, then this is impossible. No, you've demonstrated that this is true. Now go and see if that is impossible. It's like they're separate experiments in a way. Yes, yes, they are. And it's a great example. There's all of these veridical examples from the near-death literature to remote viewing. I'll tell you who takes the psi phenomena seriously, the black budget programs, like the conventional science, not wanting consciousness to have a role at the table is 70 to 100 years behind the actual behavior 
of these black budget carved out programs. Anyone who's working with the stuff that we're dealing with today, these are folks getting tens of billions of dollars in black budget funding for these carved out programs. They know and understand and operate with the recognition that consciousness is an indispensable feature of whatever it is we're dealing with, with however it's going on, we either are going to ignore it because we don't want to deal with it and then we're going to lose any kind of parity and relationship with it or we're going to do as they have been doing so <clears throat> i'm talking specifically about all of these people working in really exotic tech i mean you can think of s4 or you can think of the remote viewing programs that were run by hal put off and others with ingo swan and there's a litany of these instances, but all of them involve consciousness. All of them understand that time, space, the immediacy of, of communication, the manner in which information becomes available to the recipient, but also crucially that the inside and the outside, as you were just describing, are absolutely tethered in this way that they're never going to be severed. And the desire, which I get it, I understand the feeling of folks want these to be like, they're just craft, someone's driving them, there must be something about them, we don't, you know, we're gonna recover them and we're gonna build these new weapons with them. They want it to be nuts and bolts, they want it to be something that fits and is appropriate in our present known reality. And that's just not gonna happen. And what you're describing about how the two of these in a real old school, Hinduism, old school Buddhism, this, the hilarity of it all, again, to like mad props to the humor, it goes back to this form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. I am you, you are me. Like that's, in, and in my language, you can't say an opposite without invoking its inverse because they're absolute, the complementarity of opposites. And I'm excited about that. I think it's gonna be great. We're gonna get there. We're hitting some obstacles right now, but you know, we'll work the kinks out. <laughs> Actually. Yes. I think just like, like any other um, evolution, let's say, of, or, or racing through the levels of, of consciousness of, or the, the development, you know, that Ken talks about, that Wilbur talks about. I yeah. think just like in, in any other step, I believe it's, it's been happening um, who knows what the cost might be behind it, what's kind of pushing that development, but it's very simply just uh, death and, and the new generation of people understand the world differently than the people before. And eventually uh, you, you get, you, you go from, from the very, very, very mythical or magical understanding to where we are today. And, and, and I'm thankful that we are in this period where we are, we are moving uh, uh, past or, or above the, the, the state we've been in for so long and starting to, to embrace the, the old ways. So like you were mentioning the, the, the very old school Buddhist and Hinduist views, which until a few years ago, perhaps, would be yeah that's just some some crazy mumbo jumbo um barbaric religion from from people who didn't know better or something like that yeah. whereas now we can look at those things and say wow how how amazing are the wisdom that is uh deep within those symbols and 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 not take it just literal but also learn to, to understand how those uh, worldviews still apply today. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. And maybe one last thing to share is that I think it behooves us as well to consider the possibility that death evolves. Mm -hmm. And I believe you were implying that in some sense and that we have, even within spiritual traditions, there is sometimes a notion that evolution takes place here inside the human body. We go through development. It assists and facilitates our soul in deepening and expanding through experience of this precious human vehicle. And then we die. And then we go to this, whatever that is, we're there for a while. And then we reincarnate. And like, 
lately, in great part because I went through a study to become an end-of-life doula, lately I feel this attraction toward the possibility that the afterlife evolves and that that is in part what is facilitating, just as you said, the inside and the outside are in this relationship in a more meta sense. Well, incarnation and excarnation are always in relationship and mutually co-evolving in some way. And that's just a brand new point that I'm just beginning to ask is how does death evolve? Maybe you I can get into that at some future point. Yeah, that's, I mean, this has been such a great conversation. We've gone all over the place and, and we, we dove deep into, into many, many of those spaces. There's so much to talk about. And at the same time, the, the hilarity again of, of the, the, the limited nature of language itself, yeah. how language doesn't really describe anything, but at the same time, it, it helps in understanding the, the undescribable, which is what yeah. we're talking about, I think. Uh, yeah, and I, I feel that the primary way we communicate is attunement. And this has been such a great conversation. And I think fundamentally because of the attunement between you and I, which is palpable to me. Mm -hmm. And then language is sort of like the sugary items nice. sprinkled on the top of that cake. You know, they're relevant, they help and everything, but fundamentally it's attunement. Mm -hmm. And then to whatever degree language can become involved. Right. I see kind of like the emotion connects naturally and then the, the words help the mind stay focused on the on the emotion maybe or yeah that's a great way to put it beautiful yeah. well i do have to go because my dog is beginning to protest yeah <laughs> yes i don't know if you can hear him but he's he's using his language yeah he has some signifiers that he uses with me which mean get up this is enough <laughs> <laughs> hey really um Stuart, this was great I hope we can do this again. Uh, I do too. I, I enjoyed it so much. Please come on my show. Uh, I would love to do it again. And I'll just ping you through email, sure. um, send you a few other things that I think we mentioned. I want to get you that Amy Michelle article just so you have it for show notes uh, so people can see for themselves. And if there's anything I forget, just let me know. Yeah, awesome. You've been a, a really great guest. It's been a pleasure speaking. And yeah, the attunement uh, is, is mutual. I feel it as well. Um, it's been really, really great getting to know you and getting to, to speak. Uh, like Likewise. Cosmic hugs. Cosmic hugs to you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.